My name is Anthony Brown. I'm the Chairman Emeritus of Men Having Babies. Uh, I'm also a parent through surrogacy. Uh, I'm going to speak really fast because we've got so much to get through, but the first thing I want to do is I want to thank Ron and I want to thank all of the members of the coalition for pulling together something so comprehensive with so many amazing people to answer questions and to get this information out. Um, the, this panel is very personal to me. Uh, a lot of the things that we are going to talk about stemmed from a conversation that I had with my assembly member uh, uh, in August. Uh, and, who, and who had some concerns about the bill and is one of the um, key people that we really want to help to educate. Uh, and I'm so happy that her chief of staff is here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, also, just Ron spoke about looking through this kind of as an adoption lens. And in New York, we really have not caught up with the way that we create our families. And I think one of the biggest differences with looking at it from an adoption point of view is in surrogacy, before that child is even conceived, they have parents who have done an incredible amount of research. They have uh, a, a team around them that has helped them to understand and get informed consent about the process. They have ensured that all of the moving parts, uh, the agency, the lawyer, the doctors, and most in particular, the egg donors and the surrogates have all understood what the process is and enters into the process um, of their own volition with complete understanding. So that's part of what we are going to be talking about today. And our format's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to introduce um, our speakers, and I'm going to have you speak for, if you can, for about five minutes. I know that's a Herculean task. Um, but we're going to try to cover some of the things that um, were brought up in my conversation with uh, Deb Blake. So first of all, we have uh, Dr. Michael Doyle. He practiced for 25 years at Connecticut Fertility as a reproductive endocrinologist and is on the board of Men Having Babies. And Dr. Doyle is going to talk about the role of medical screening and how to assure independence and transparency. Michael? Thank you, Anthony, and everyone welcome. Yeah, uh, from the 30 years ago when I started training in reproductive medicine until today, We've seen many, many positive examples of the ways in which the reproductive medical community has evolved and learned to identify and prioritize issues relative to safety and risk management, both for the surrogates and the donors, uh, as well as the children that result. And one of, the, one of the shifts that we've seen over the last even 20 years is the realization that the doctor and the medical team is really equally responsible for those four groups, for not only in the intended parents who are very clear with us about what their desires and goals are, but equally committed to safeguarding the safety and the well-being of the donors and the surrogates and creating pregnancies that impose minimal risk as possible to the children that result. So as a result of this, over the years, we've defined much more rigorous screening protocols that, again, are developed to protect the safety of the donors and the surrogates. Um, highly, highly uh, rigorous to the point that it's estimated now that about one in 30 surrogate applicants uh, will pass the screening. So it's nothing close to the past when, when somebody's willingness to be a surrogate was half the battle. Um, we've also relying more and more on data to make our practice patterns. And we've learned that, for example, the fertility drugs that we give to the donors or the surrogates or the natural hormones, we can now reliably, based on data, rather than just hope and conjecture, say that these drugs are not associated with long-term risks of the dreaded development of reproductive cancers or even for up to six months of six different cycles of use not associated with loss of reproductive potential down the road. Um, one of the risks that's undeniable and the one I want to emphasize most today for surrogates is, is the treatment imposed risk that's associated with multiple pregnancy. Uh, besides the risks of, let's even say twins, to the, to the surrogate, uh, prolonged bed rest, probably due to preterm labor, hospitalization, elevated blood pressure, elevated blood sugar, these are all largely avoidable risks, not to mention the risks to the, the babies of prematurity and all the short-term and long-term sequelae associated with that. So one of the ways that I've seen the medical field evolve is to use the data that's guided us to that realization 
and develop strict treatment protocols to the point now today that I don't think it's very controversial that single embryo transfer is probably not only strongly advocated, but should really be the only treatment option available, despite the fact that there are many intended parents who will make the argument that for whatever reason they want to set up a twin pregnancy, and many, many surrogates who might be willing to kind of go along with this. So I think, I think this is a shift in, in sort of the ideological um, landscape that now um, challenges these old constructs that because intended parents are paying, that this in some way confers to them the right to define treatment protocols and to shape the, the journey that this, and the risks associated with that that a surrogate will, will face. Um, even as little as 10 years ago, I would say for the most part intended parents uh, were allowed to call most of the shots. Um, when I practiced, of course, the, the needs and the, and the desires and the risks and the informed consent to the surrogate was critical. But I think at the end of the day, much, much more than now, uh, the wishes and the desires, again, based on the power dynamic, the financial dynamic, was that if an intended set of intended parents wanted to have twins, for example, as long as the surrogate was willing to go along with it, that was generally what, what we did. Um, this, this budges right up very, very, very closely to issues of uh, entitlement, um, certainly issues of potential exploitation, um, and even subtle coercion. I feel like medical teams now and, and, and uh, clinics across the country are far more sensitive to than they are now, and our treatment plans, by and large, are guided by the safety and well-being of everyone involved, not just the wishes of the parents. So the donors and the surrogates and the baby or babies that we produce are what guide our uh, treatment patterns and the strategies that we offer. Um, screening, as I said, is rigorous. And it's the rare person who navigates through it and is, and is passed. Um, like I said, one in 30 is the general average. The bar that we set for surrogates to be permitted and allowed to, to go through the process is far stricter and more rigorous than a bar as a fertility specialist I would require for a, a woman coming to me who's wanting to give birth herself. Because I think it's generally known and accepted that uh, infertile women are more likely to have higher risk pregnancies just by virtue of the fact that they have medical conditions, they may have uterine conditions, they may have advanced age, they may be walking into this but eyes wide open to the risk factors that they carry. But, but when we take care of surrogates, it's our responsibility to set the bar in such a way that almost any risk, I mean every pregnancy has a risk, there's no pregnancy in the world that doesn't for some kind of risk, but when we have the option to review records, for example, this is a huge part of what we do before we even meet with a surrogate, someone might say to me, well, I've had, I've had three healthy babies, my kids are great, they were all vaginally delivered, and we left the hospital in two days. That sounds pretty awesome. But when we dig a little bit deeper and, and get the records, and this is a requirement of every clinic before they will pass someone, you might say, well, actually, the babies were born two to three weeks early. Again, not horrible, but not great. Uh, there was diabetes twice, one at a time, and managed well, so it wasn't a problem. Maybe insulin once, blood pressure needed to be corrected. All these things can be corrected, but these would be situations that we would conclude for the safety of the children at the other end, or even for the surrogate herself, would not pass screening. So these are all ways, I think, that we've evolved so that it's not just about people coming in with money that want a certain outcome, and it's our job to give it to them. Thank you. Um, it, uh, I can say from a child who, uh, who was born 10 years ago, technology has changed so much in the time since when my son was born. Um, we have asked uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Fox to put, stay on the, the panel to go into a little bit about from the medical screening aspect to the psychological screening aspect and how to ensure mm -hmm. that the uh, surrogates understand what they are getting into and how to uh, protect both them and the intended parents when uh, the situation isn't appropriate for them. So Dr. Doyle talked about the primary um, 
goal of ensuring the physical safety of uh, the, the surrogate. And, and I think that the, the role of the psychologist or the role of the mental health professional is really to ensure the psychological and emotional well-being of the surrogate, um, of her partner, of her children, um, of her entire family throughout this process. And um, to this end, actually what mental health professionals do is really uh, a, a three part process. First of all, we have a psychological evaluation, a, um, a testing piece that I'll talk about in a min minute. But there's an educational piece where we um, explain and teach and educate both the surrogate and her partner about um, what it means to be part of this process before she gets pregnant, while she gets pregnant, uh, when she gives birth, after she gives birth, when the child uh, grows older, to kind of really look at all the aspects and the emotional um, minefields that might come up throughout the process and make sure that she's really informed and she really understands what she might be getting into. And then the last part uh, that a psychologist does is a counseling piece where from the beginning, uh, should she need any kind of support? Should she and her partner need any kind of support throughout the journey? Should she and the intended parents need any kind of support and facilitation of dialogue, both before uh, the journey starts and throughout, the psychologist steps in and facilitates that. So I, I think that what people often are interested in is understanding what do we do by way of testing and evaluating um, the uh, surrogates. And the psychological testing process is very elaborate. First of all, we start with testing uh, by objective measures. We do psychological testing where we first of all look to make sure that there is no psychopathology, there's no mental health issues. This is not a person who is in any way emotionally fragile uh, in a way that could damage her, could damage her family or could damage the uh, intended parents. Second of all, we want to make sure that even if she is stable and healthy now, there isn't a history of a significant mental health issues, that she hasn't in her past dealt with emotional issues that might uh, come, come back throughout the journey. We look both at uh, major mental illness and major mental issues, but we also look at losses. What significant losses has she had in her life? How has she dealt with them? What kind of trauma has she dealt with, both emotional and physical? Could she, for example, we would never allow someone who has been through any kind of sexual trauma uh, to go through surrogacy because the whole process of even getting pregnant might bring back some uh, post-traumatic effects as a result of that. Um, we want to make sure that they are women who are at a stable point in their lives, that they're not going through chaos and turmoil because, again, uh, we want to ensure the safety of them, themselves and of their families and not add more chaos and disruption to what might be already um, difficult. We want to make sure that um, they are financially stable, that there isn't, a, that they're not coming from a place of desperation, that they're not coerced in any, in any way, that there's no pressure, that uh, I look a great deal at the relationship between uh, the partners to really make sure that there isn't kind of a partner who is kind of, uh, let's say, a husband who is subtly pushing her or, or kind of gently encouraging her to do this, even though she's not totally on board of this. Uh, we look at the partner quite a lot. Um, many psycho uh, uh, mental health professionals actually test the partner for the same kind of uh, variables that I'm talking about uh, with a surrogate. 
And in any case, we have a long meeting with a partner and with surrogate and partner, and we look at their relationship. Can they be there for each other? Is he on board? Does he understand as much as she does the medical aspects of it, the emotional aspects of it? How is he expecting to enter in this relationship with the intended parents and with a child that will be born. This is a relationship that will be long lasting. So we really wanna make sure that everybody who comes into this comes from a place of autonomy, of really understanding what they're getting into, from a place of emotional stability, from a place of ability to negotiate relationships with each other and with the intended parents. I look a great deal at how does this woman resolve conflict? How does she deal with, with authority? How is she at following orders? What does she do when she's frustrated? What does she do when she has to say goodbye to people? What does she do uh, when she has to recover from hardship? These are all area things that we uh, look at and to, as a result of that, a great deal of the women who would like to be surrogates actually do not get through the psychological testing because it really is the unique woman who can meet all this uh, criteria that gets through uh, the gates. Thank you. Um, uh, I wanna switch gears a little bit and introduce uh, uh, someone who I've known for a very long time, Vicki Ferrara. Vicki Ferrara is the legal director uh, and the founder of Worldwide Surrogacy Specialist. She's also personally responsible for changing the parentage law in Connecticut. Um, Vicki, you have a really interesting perspective because you've walked surrogates and intended parents through the whole process. You've, you've, you've had the practical experience of doing that. And what I'd like for you to speak to is what you see in terms of the support aspect of it as an attorney, the um, making sure that the contracts, that the surrogates understand the contracts, that there's the representation is adequate, and, and any other um, uh, experiences that you have that you feel are relevant to supporting the parties through the whole process. Thank you, Anthony. It's great to see you in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot five minutes. <laughs> um, so it's great to see everybody. Um, you know, I look at surrogacy, uh, it's a complex process, and I look at it as, um, you know, a, a group of people, parents and the surrogate and her husband, if she's married, um, as a very important group of people um, related to each other for this period of time of the surrogacy process. And they need to be supported because it's a complex process. They need to be supported by a team of professionals, the doctor, the lawyer, the case managers. And with respect to surrogates, I, I think, I believe that every woman who steps up to uh, become a surrogate should be treated with respect, gratitude, deference. And even the ones who don't make it through the screening, because they're stepping up, so if for whatever reason they don't make it, still, you know, they're stepping up. And um, in terms of um, um, autonomy, um, you mentioned autonomy, and uh, Dr. Doyle mentioned that even though the parents are paying for medical treatment, the doctor still treats the surrogate. She, she is the patient. And it's the same with the law. Um, the parents may pay for the legal fee of the lawyer for the surrogate, but the lawyer um, will, will represent the surrogate and her concerns and her needs. And there's no such thing as one lawyer for the, for the contract for both sides. And there's no such thing as lawyers, there shouldn't be any such thing as lawyers from the same firm um, representing the surrogate and the parents. Everyone should have independent counsel. So the parents should have an independent lawyer to work on the, the contract with them and be their legal advisor throughout the process. And the surrogate must have an independent lawyer that she chooses, and sometimes they will come to the process with their own lawyer, that's fine. They, they, maybe they're experienced and they have a lawyer from their prior journey, maybe not, but they know of a lawyer from uh, another person who is a surrogate. If they don't have a lawyer, they must be provided with one, a competent lawyer in the field of surrogacy, reproductive law. And then, and then uh, they, they have the proper legal representation and they can have input into the contract that they're going to sign. Is there a conflict of interest because the parents are paying? There's a, a potential for a conflict of interest. It should be disclosed. But lawyers who follow their respective codes of ethics will be representing the surrogate properly. Um, 
in terms of um, providing the surrogate with support, and all the parties, the parents with support and the surrogate with support, this is crucial. Um, they, um, it, th there should be some case management piece. Uh, so um, it, in, in our organization, there's a case manager um, who takes care of the intended parents throughout the entire process. I'm always weighing in on legal matters. And then on our team, we have two women who are surrogates. And so every surrogate has also a support person. So there's two track case management. There's the case manager and there's the support person who's contacting the surrogate every week and sometimes more um, you know, when, when difficult things are going on. What kinds of difficult things? You, usually it's the medical things. Um, there's rare, rarely, I don't, can't even remember in my own experience, a contract dispute between intended parents and a surrogate. If it's done right, if the screening is done right, if the professionals are doing their jobs right, the contract will be a smooth process, a smooth road Map. But um, the medical things that happen are the things that we can't control. So a miscarriage or um, the surrogate doesn't get pregnant, um, other medical concerns, right? So there, there, and there should be more support. And um, I also believe there should be an allotment of money for counseling, um, whether it's because of a miscarriage and the feelings that go along with that. And, and surrogates, you know, it's not, most of the time, it's not about the, the feeling of their loss. It's they feel bad for the parents. They feel um, a level of guilt because they haven't been able to do this for the parents because they come to the process really wanting to help to create a family. They're not coming to it selfishly at all. Yes, they want to make a little bit of money, but that's to me, that's a, a lesser motivation than the motivation to help create a family, to bond and relate to people and make this happen. So um, there, should be, there should be an availability of counseling. They don't have to go for it, but they can definitely have the option of going for that. Uh, every woman who, who wants to become a surrogate should be informed. She needs to know that she has choices for legal counsel. She needs to know that she has an absolute right to make medical decisions for herself. And so, of course, we always say and hope that if something goes wrong, the parties will work together to make decisions um, for the pregnancy, um, if there needs to be a termination or a selective reduction, you know, but, but basically, uh, the surrogate should always know that she has a right to make, she's the patient, she has a right to make medical decisions for herself, that autonomy that you mentioned. And I know when I take uh, people to court for the uh, pre-birth order in Connecticut, the judge always wants to hear us ask the surrogate, do you know that you have the right to make decisions for yourself during the pregnancy and the delivery and the birth? And because they've already been informed, they know that, but the, in Connecticut, the judge wants it on the record and in the order. Um, and so um, what else here? How, what have we seen um, difficulties that require support? Well, one time um, the surrogate wasn't communicating with the parent enough and he was worried, his intended father from Europe, he was worried and he wasn't hearing from her enough and she was complaining that her phone wasn't working. So we sent her to the phone store to get a new iPhone and the problem was solved. So there can be very mundane practical problems like that that you can really resolve very easily just by being attentive and listening and figuring out what the help is that is needed. Um, other things that are you know, more difficult are, again, the medical things. Um, rarely, but um, occasionally, there's a later term miscarriage, and it's devastating for everyone, the parents, the surrogate, um, and there needs to be a lot of support and attention given to everyone in that, in that process. So again, I'm gonna go back to the team of professionals, um, the lawyers, um, the, the agency representatives, the case managers, the doctors, we are the group that supports like, like, like a, a cell, like there's a nucleus of the people that are going to bring this baby into the world, and then there's the group of professionals supporting them. And I think we all need to realize that it's, this is not a transactional matter. This is not a commodity. We are helping to create families, to bring babies into the world. 
So there has to be a great deal of, I guess, attention and respect for the fact that it's such a human endeavor, such a relational endeavor. And um, I, think, I think I may be preaching to the choir and all of us here know that, but um, I think that in terms of ethics and mm -hmm. best practices, that's what we should be thinking about. Thank you, Vicki. Um, uh, and, and we're going to end with uh, a little bit more of a broad perspective. Peggy Swain is a member of the American Bar Association Family Law Section on Assisted Reproduction, but she's also the director of the Assisted Reproduction Practice of Quad A, which is the American Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproduction Attorneys. She has a perspective of how laws have played out over different, in different jurisdictions. When statutes have been enacted in one state, uh, what was the reaction to that? In, in places where statutes were piecemeal, how did that um, necessarily play out? And uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit, Peggy, about the concept of um, legislation and self-regulation at the mm -hmm. same time. Uh, the industry, we, you know, we've heard from all the professionals in the industry, they all have independent professional standards which, that they have to um, abide by. How does that play into the, the um, connection with the legislation? Mm -hmm. So I think there's been a fear that legislation in this area can be very difficult to approach because of all the professionals involved and how are we uh, as lawmakers going to incorporate everything pertaining to every group of professionals into a bill that will govern assisted reproductive technology. Well, I think um, from what you were saying, Anthony, and listening to the groups of professionals represented up here, we are all held to our own standards of practice. These are codified in every state. Physicians' standards of care Mental health professionals have to follow the standards set forth by their groups. Lawyers have codes of ethics and are uh, subject to disciplinary action if we don't follow them. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Relying on the thoughtful, analytical approach that you've all heard demonstrated by those of us who really work in this field every day, I think is a good demonstration of self-regulation and something that does not necessarily need to be incorporated into a bill about assisted reproductive technology and procreation. So another point I'd like to make, though, is about the overall ethical approach and keeping surrogacy and related procreative actions ethical. Every single person up here has talked about that, how the safeguards and the protections that each of us incorporate into our practices really reflect how these processes go forward in the real world. Keeping it ethical means looking out for the rights of every person involved in this, and most importantly, never forgetting the rights of the resultant child to having a secure place within his family or her family upon birth. And that, I think, really needs to be the overarching approach to these uh, bills and laws, hopefully laws that will govern them. The other point is, and Anthony, you also alluded to this, um, the omnibus bill, the Uniform Parentage Act that some of us have been fortunate enough to have initiated in our states, others of us piecemeal. So, in the bills that we have seen made into law, have they had to, have they um, come to a place where they need to be revised? And if so, what are the changes that have happened? In my perspective and from what I have seen, the kinds of changes are really very small. They're made to read 
uh, to clarify definitions that have been included in laws, to perhaps add additional terms, and also to address some of the practical aspects of uh, law. Sometimes a bill is written um, and becomes amended or changes are made in the uh, formation process that were not really intended to be in the bill by those of us who work in the field and understand how the processes go forward. So the changes are often just to make it a simpler process, not necessarily or, or never, to set aside safeguards and protections, but to further define how things work within the court system, for example, or with the Department of Health, where the Division of Vital Records is housed and where the birth certificates are created. What I have seen is more enabling language as opposed to something that is reactive and restrictive because the concerns about, for instance, a large number of people all of a sudden coming into one state because now they have an enforcement statute, really that has not happened. There are so many safeguards in place that we heard about from Dr. Doyle and from Dr. Fox and from Ms. Ferreira about allowing people to participate in these arrangements, particularly surrogates, but also egg donors. Many are called, but few are chosen. And so having a big influx of people into any one particular state really is not something that we have seen in, in this field. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I know, I know we're speeding through this, but if you could please just uh, thank the panel for, uh, for, for the information that 